All right. Well, <clears throat> let's talk to Father. Because if he doesn't help us, we're in trouble. <laughs> right. Father, thank you for the awesome the awesomeness of your giftings. And Lord, we want to steward them with righteousness, with holiness. We want to learn from what you're doing in our lives. And so as we share tonight, we begin to talk about the dealings of God in, to, in the lives of men and the training of God. Would you take us, if we've been through any, but take us through a tour Holy Spirit of our history and apply the truths we should have learned had we known because you're able to do all that and we don't have to go through it again thank you so Father tonight come rest upon our ears rest upon me and let me bring forth that which is vital for the people listening to understand Father thank you in your precious name and everybody said, Amen. 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 Yeah. Or oh me. Gloria had a question yesterday. <laughs> well, she, she, <laughs> she needs the mic. We're going to start with a question tonight, folks. While they're taking the mic over there, I want to okay. greet those of you who are online. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, although we don't mention it very often. Once I get going, I motor. So, all right. Okay. On? Yes, you are. Ask your question, dear. In uh, the book for this course, uh, I come across something you have written. So I just wrote here. And I'll ask my question after I read what you had written. The washing of the water of the word, that is the rhema, cleanses and renews us in the mind. And my question was, because it said, and the spirit. Be renewed the in the spirit of your mind. And I said, what is, I can understand the concept of having my mind renewed, but what does it mean? The spirit. Often in scripture when it talks about the spirit of something, it's talking about the motivating. The motivation. The whole motivation of your thinking is changed. Oh, okay. Otherwise we would think we'd fall back into the pit of thinking humanly. Okay. In the natural, not in the spiritual dimensions. Okay, that answers okay? it. All right, so we're going to continue to talk about principles of function and we're going into the dealings of God to produce prophets. Too often we have men and women who are gifted but not characterized. Explain that. <laughs> Very simply, they have the gift but they don't have the character. Okay. See, God, everything God does in our life is to produce His character in us. He doesn't it's not that he doesn't like your character. He wants to make you like he is a character. I mean, he, his character. <laughs> okay. So we're going to look at Elijah. The first portion of Elijah's training before his first assignment was totally unseen and unrecorded. Now, some of us have been there and we know our call, but we say, God, why is there no doors opening? Why, why, why? And God's not upset at your why, as long as it doesn't end with an N-E, wind. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is placed here because it's one of the ways that God will train some of his men and women. If he sees it's essential. Some prophetic voices, it's essential that they be trained out of sight. Okay? This training had the following elements to it. 
these four training components of god are important because there are many being trained this way in the prophetic company that god is raising up listen the enemy always produces the faults first that's why we have such chaos in the prophetic community right now please hear me sometimes the message may be right but the character is not there the holiness is not there the nature of jesus is not there consequently people are wounded by an honest gifting okay these four were brought to my attention as i listened to chuck swindoll years ago they're also recorded in his book a man of passion and destiny david because david for the first 17 years of his life was trained this way so let's look at these and you can either say amen or ouch or i don't want to go there one or the other <laughs> obscurity Isaiah 58 and 10, And if thou draw thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise, where? Oh, you mean have to be in obscurity before your light can rise. Mm -hmm. yep. oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't look so excited. <laughs> <laughs> then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. But it, it will be in your coming out of or rising up out of obscurity. The light does not shine until you've been in obscurity. That means nobody knows who you are. Nobody understands your revelation. Nobody understands your calling. And they marginalize you in every sense of the word. That's obscurity. I've been there, I've done that, and I don't want to go back. All right. <laughs> Monotony. Isn't this a, an exciting one? Monotony. Repetition without variety. Sameness. My training in this was as a house husband. My wife's mother was sick nigh unto death. In fact, they thought she was going to die. My father-in-law was not well. So my wife would drive him every day 50 miles to the hospital, stay all day, and then come back. We not only had our five kids, we also had another family living with us with four kids. So there were nine kids in the house, and I was on house duty. Couldn't go out to minister because too many kids. <laughs> and so... I'm standing at the sink one day, washing dishes after, you know, I'd spent all morning getting lunch ready and it was gone in half an hour. Yep. <laughs> you women know what I'm talking about. Amen, brother. Okay. And, and I'm standing there doing dishes and I'm going to, you know, I'm thinking about saying this out loud. Lord, what's this got to do with preaching? But when I opened my mouth, all that came out was, Lord, you're just so good. <laughs> that was my spirit overriding my soul in worship. And I spent quite a number of months as a house, house husband. I would get a Sunday to minister somewhere, and that's just to keep it alive. <laughs> just for God to let me know I haven't forgotten you. I'm still going to use you, but this training is essential. And there's nothing no more monotonous than housework. Amen. Hello. Oh, <laughs> Doing dishes, getting meals, and re put the, putting that on repeat three times a day. Okay. Oh, the laundry. I couldn't forget the laundry. Nine kids, I had laundry. <laughs> But it's one of God's training tools. And many, when God brings them into that training room, they try and find a place to run. 
But see, it's there God develops patience. Okay, I wondered why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people water the impatience plant. The impatience plant is a beautiful flower, but it's messy. Well, we won't talk about the impatience plant in any of your lives. We'll be okay. The third one is solitude. The deserts of God. Aloneness. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 15, I think it's around verse 7 or 17, he said, I sat alone because of your hand upon me. There are times when God will put his hand on you and leave you alone. No one will understand. You don't understand. You're lonely. You're in a crowd and you're still lonely. And it's because God's hands on you, doing a work in you and preparing you for times when you're going to have to stand alone with a face adamant against those resisting the word of God. Okay. A study of the wilderness experiences of Israel and David would help us grasp the principle of what God desires to produce in us by leading us through Operative word is through these wildernesses. Some people, when they get to the wilderness experiences, run. They run back to the city and they run away from the call of God. There's a, um, another passage in one of the minor prophets, I think it's Hosea, and it says this. It says, I brought you into the wilderness of the people. Hmm. That is where you are in among the people, and it is an alone experience. It is usually the children of Israel's type of experience where in the wilderness they whined. They had a wine and cheese party. They were cheesed off and they whined all the time. And their heart condition was exposed, a heart murmur. Because out of the abundance of the heart, and there were always murmuring. And that is God's wilderness of the people to train his prophet. Okay? Well, whether it's okay or not, it's true. Anyway. <laughs> In Job 3 and 7, Lo, let the, that night be solitary, let no joyful voice come therein. So that in the, in the solitary place, there is no joy. Oh, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. You going through this time and letting God take you through causes his heart joy, and that's what gives you strength. Oh, boy. Would you say that again? Would you say that again? <laughs> It says the joy of the Lord. And what we've, we've, we've read that this way. My feeling the joy of the Lord gives me strength. No, no. It's the joy of the what gives the Lord joy. When I give the Lord joy, he gives me strength. It's an exchange. So the Lord has joy in our solitude. The Lord has joy. No, in this case, there was no joyful voice coming. But when I go, when I allow him to take me into solitude and go through it and submit to the, the training in it, it gives him joy, which gives me strength to go through the solitude. Don't look so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need some Kleenex down there? <laughs> we just started. Now. Oh, no. <laughs> Cheer up, we got more to go. <laughs> but does that help you understand some of the stuff you've been through and didn't understand? Okay. Job 30 and verse 3, for want and famine, they were solitary. When we're going through spiritual want and spiritual famine. And the famine in scripture is not lack of something to eat. It's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Isn't that what I think it's Hosea again says? Not a famine of bread, nor of meat, but a famine of hearing. 
the word of the Lord. And in that same context, it says they will run from sea to sea seeking a word from the Lord. Oh, you mean when I don't hear a word, I go looking for one. When God has me in a solitary place for training. Psalm 68, verse 6, God sets the solitary in families. After you've been through the solitary and had that experience, God set you in a local body that becomes your family. Okay? Then the fourth training tool is reality. Facing life's events without any cushions. That's part of God's training for us. So someone can go through all four of these at the same time? Levels of them, yes. Oh. I just got shot. All right. <laughs> See, no. reality being when, wow, he says, think it not strange when these things come upon you. Consider, think it not strange of the fiery trials which try your faith. But the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold. But because we're going through the trial, we don't look for the gold. We again have another wine and cheese party. I think God's going to take some of that cheese off the table and the wine too. All right. All right. These four produce four things in you. Spirituality is the ability to come into harmony with the heart of God in any situation. As we develop that thought, we will see that it covers three major areas. The mind, going back to your question. Involved in this would be learning to put on the mind of Christ and coming to a renewal of the spirit or motivating force of our mind. Ephesians 4 and 22. Learning how to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12 and 2. Not the taking away of your mind, but the renewing of your mind. Beginning to learn how to think as God thinks. That's the mind of Christ. How does God think? What is God's perception of this? What is the throne seeing of this as opposed to looking at the underside of what's going on? This brings us to a sense of the uselessness of our own thinking and our need to know God's desire for each step we take in our walk with him. He is going to bring us to a place where we do not move without knowing that he's ordered our steps. Wow. See, if he says that it's possible, it's possible regardless of whether I have ever experienced it or anyone outside of Jesus Christ has ever experienced it. He says it's possible. He's going to bring forth a people who walk that way. See, this builds in us a sense of need for a relationship with him that hears clearly. God is digging the wax out of our spiritual ears. As you know, I have hearing aids. Some days... They're valuable and some days are... Anyway, um, the first thing I do in the morning is clean out my ears, get the wax out. Otherwise, literally, they can slip out because the wax is so... So God is, every morning, He wants to clean the wax out of our ears so that we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Second of all, spirituality and my will. Included in this would be the statement of Jesus in the garden, not my will. By the way, he wouldn't have said that if he didn't have a will. His last wrestling was wrestling his will to obedience to the Father. He experienced bringing every thought into captivity. That's why he could say through Paul, 
that we're to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because Jesus did it. And in the garden, you see how far it would go. It, it says he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, have you ever read Hebrews where it said, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin? That's what Jesus was doing in the garden. And if we're going to follow in his steps, there's going to be some expression of that in our training and bringing us through to the destiny of God for us. Okay? Be learning to, to will to know the true doctrine of God. John 7, 17, and this kind of messes with our theology. You ever have God mess with your theology? Well, I'm about to do it now. I'm not that I'm God. Okay. <laughs> John 7, 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. But we want to know the doctrine before we do the will. But it is in doing the, it is in knowing, it, it is in doing the obeying God that we learn how to apply the doctrine of God. We may know it theologically, but how many know often, well, I, I trained as an orderly years ago, and I had been working as an orderly for about four years before I took the course. Everybody wondered why I got 96. I got 96 because I had applied everything that they were asking me on the test. I'd already applied it for four years. And see, because I knew the application, then I knew how to do the will. Experience. Experience, which is still the best teacher. Okay? And often... There's hardly ever a textbook case. There's hardly ever a black and white textbook case in any field. There's usually additives. And so the Holy Spirit wants to take the principles of God and teach us how to apply them in different situations. And so one of the things he does is take us through things where he asks us to do something that we don't know the theology of. <coughs> And it's in doing and obeying that we learn the lesson that embeds itself in our character and nature. So, he said, if a man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. See, learning to give up self-will and let him work into us the will and to do of his good pleasure. This is one of the most comforting scriptures I know. For it is God that worketh in you both both to will and to do. Those are two separate operations. It's God that works in you, produces in you, deals with you. What to do? To bring me to will, to align my will with his will, and then he gives me the ability to do of his good pleasure. Colossians 1 and 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that what? If he says that's what he's praying for, is it possible? Have you ever heard those prayers that grate on you? Lord, if it be thy will. <laughs> Folks, he tells me I can know his will, and I not only can know it, I can know it in all wisdom, and I can have the spiritual understanding of it, not just the natural understanding of it. Well, we need to lift our vision. God says I can know his will, and God is not one to put the carrot in front of the donkey. Okay? E, eating meat, full maturity's food is to do the will of him that sent us. Maturity, full maturity, 
is doing the will. Knowing and doing the will. It is not knowing everything there is. Do you know many of our, our uh, brethren behind the curtains are much more mature than we are? Because they hear and obey. And they're taught, when you, if you've ever read The Heavenly Man, tremendous book. I met the man. So it wasn't just a theology. This man was walking that way. He, he went into a nominal church. They had him there in the city in Kingston. And he began to prophesy over all those guys. Some of them didn't even know there was such a thing as prophecy. But he learned God through relationship, and later got the Bible. Wow. And later got the Bible. Because he was saved in coming in China. There was no Bible available. Wow. Folks, somehow, I love the word, as you know, but somehow we've got to put relationship above knowledge. Until we do, we can't do these things I've been talking about. Our will cannot be changed. Our will cannot be adapted to what God wants. It cannot be aligned with him because we're trying to find doctrine to fit what we're hearing. When he said, if you'll do the will, you'll know the doctrine. And I know that's a dangerous thing, okay? Because people can say, well, Bill is anti-doctrine. No, I'm not. But I'll tell you, when God applies doctrine, it's often different than our concepts of its application. So, also, spirituality and the emotions. These are volatile, in case you didn't notice. You've never seen somebody get emotional, so, you know. Man cannot control his emotions. Only God can. Okay? Here is where we learn, here we learn that in him we live and move and have our very being and how it's applied practically. Here by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the expression of the emotions of God, we learn how to express his sentiments in a situation and not our sentiments. God wants to so align us with him that we know how he feels on a situation. That is one of the major functions of the prophetic office. So the second thing produced is humility. To be humble means to have a servant's heart, not just to do serving. Many do serving, but they're serving so they can get graduate out of the servant realm. If I serve enough, maybe they'll promote me. I mean, I've been around a day or two. Okay? A servant is teachable. He is amendable to correction, open to rebuke and reproof, and instruction in righteousness. I might say that these can come in his life without him becoming upset at the vessel being used to administer the needed teaching. A servant has a sense of dependence. Jesus said, the servant knows not what his Lord do. Am I willing to do what God says without knowing the reasons? Why you put me through this? Oh, there we go. We open another bottle of wine. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll made this statement. When we depend on others, we cannot depend on God. True maturity is this. We start out as independent. Like I call it a seven-year-old. Please, mother, I'd rather do it myself. Then we go through a time of dependence. And true maturity is interdependence by choice. Okay? And God wants to get us to maturity. Where, as I could do it myself, 
because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many have heard that scripture abused? <laughs> and, 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 and I can, but that's not his plan. His plan is a corporate body of Christ functioning and flowing together. Yeah, <coughs> yeah that statement's bugging me. Good. <laughs> Have you got the microphone there somewhere? I don't know if I can word it right. Okay, that statement that says, when we depend on others, we cannot depend on God. As in our journey, we have teachers, we have those that are helping us mm -hmm. uh, to learn. Right. But we're still depending on God to teach us. The, the right attitude is the Berean attitude. They listened to Paul, but it says they went home and searched the scriptures oh, okay. to see if these things be so. Remember, in God, there's always a balance of truth. So when, when, when I make a statement, I need to say, God, where's the balancing statement to that? Okay. And too many people preach only one side. You know, they're either all dependence, all body of Christ, or they're all independence. I don't need anybody to teach me. I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need you. Both attitudes are wrong. The attitude is, yes, God can do anything he wants. Because, I mean... He can get people saved without my involvement or without anyone else's involvement. Right. He's done it over and over again. But he involves me because he wants to do work in me. Okay, there's always a balance to truth, and we've never looked for the balance. And so we've had a church that overemphasized this and another one that overemphasized this, and they fight one another instead of looking, saying, God, where's the balance in these truths? Both are truths. How many have heard all the different end time scenarios? The pre, the post, the mid, and the pan. Pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, and how it's all going to pan out. <laughs> There's truth in every one of them. But what is the balance of truth? in those three. Because see if there's enough scripture to prove one, with leaving out certain scriptures, of course, if, it, it, if it's all truth, then I've got to come to the Holy Spirit so we can put it together and balance it out. Okay? So David was not the authority in his own life. He learned in the wilderness and in keeping the sheep a dependence that carried him through all his life. He learned to depend on God. And when he didn't, he got in trouble, didn't he? When he didn't do what was normal for him to be doing at that time, at the time when kings went forth to war, he should have gone. He didn't go, and so he got hung up with Bathsheba. Okay? Because it was his place to lead the warfare. So when he didn't do what... God's appointed thing for him to do, he got in a mess. Now, God redeemed that mess because he took someone from that union and put them on the throne. And he chose it two years before Solomon was born. He named Solomon two years before he was born. How about the mercy of God? Hmm? So he was a man who throughout all of his life was an example of what it means to depend on God. When he depended on... Remember, never forget that all the enemies that David fought were mightier and stronger than he was, than his army was. Because that's what God said about all the inhabitants of the land. They're mightier and stronger than you are. And we seem to think, well, David, David was different. No, they were still mightier and stronger than he was. And if you look at the spiritual parallels in our lives, all those things that those seven nations represent are have a spiritual equivalence in us. And they're mightier and stronger than we are. If we keep that attitude, we're going to win. Okay? 
So another definition of humility is walking in what you are, not more, not less. Romans 12 and 3 says we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. So what we do is we turn the other way. We think more lowly than we ought to think. There is an ought to think level of what you need to think about yourself. And that is what is God saying about you? Never mind what Joe Blow down the road who got upset with you thinks about you. <coughs> Never mind those who think you, you can't do anything wrong. They're not right either. <laughs> what does God think about me? And to understand that, you need to read Abraham in the Old Testament and then what God says about Abraham in the New Testament. And notice there are a number of things that God left out. That God didn't talk about. The same with Moses. When God talked about Moses, Mo Moses said, I fled. I ran. After I killed the guy, I ran. Stephen, in recounting history, says that Mo Moses ran from Egypt. But God, in Hebrew, says, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Who's right? Moses' own opinion was he ran. God's opinion was no, he didn't. Who's right? So we need to begin to look at our lives from the throne rather than from the underside of the, of the um, embroidery. Okay? And God has got to show us that because we, are, we tend to focus on our negatives. By the way, how... This is going back, some, some of you younger folks might not catch this, but how do you make a positive out of a negative? In, 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 in uh, pictures? Shine the light through the negative. Catch that. If you've got some negatives in your life, ask God to show you how to shine the light through and it'll become a positive. I'll let that one just sink in. Many walk in false humility that sickens God and others as well. They keep saying how little they know and how little they can do and how many more things, many more things along that line. Others try and put it, put it on that they are further along than they really are. Let's just walk and let another man's lips praise us. Proverbs 27 and 2. Let another man's lips praise thee and not thine own. Jesus never declared himself as to who he was until after the Father had declared him. Number two, if we will let others and God declare how mature we are, we will have a lot less hassles. I often say, that when I go someplace, if they need the teacher, they'll draw out the teacher. If they need the prophet, they'll draw out the prophet. I used to go into northern Quebec, and they would say, the prophet is coming. Guess what happened when I got there? The prophet came forth, because they drew it out of me. I didn't care what they called me. I just, uh, I responded to the drawing. Another place I went, they didn't believe in prophets. But they said the teacher's coming. Guess what they got? They got the teacher. They may have got the prophetic teacher, but they got the teacher. So that's what it means, let them declare you. Let them declare me. And that way I don't have to worry about a title. I am to them what they draw out of me. There are churches where I'm a prophet. I go to it, I'm a prophet. There are other churches that call me an apostle. I don't care. I just function. And they draw out what's needed. Jesus just walked as he was. God and others declared who he was and what he was. How many know that's a lot less hassle? I don't care. True humility. Jesus, the humble servant. This is the definition of true humility. 
John, John 13, 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, and then it goes on to talk about him laying aside his coat, grabbing a towel and washing the disciples' feet. Jesus knew what man had given, or what God had given into his hands, or what was, what was his to be and do from the Father. If people would get a hold of God and find out what's theirs, there'd be a lot less messes. Mm -hmm. There are many today who are called to be teachers and are trying to be prophets. They're called to be prophets and they're trying to be apostles. And they make a mess. The thing that will bring you to God's destiny for you is his call upon your life and staying in that lane. Okay? He knew where he was sourced and motive, in motive, in word, in action, and deeds. He knew his source. Three, he knew his destiny and the route to it. That brought him to a place of security. Your security as in these three things. And the fourth one that I added is because we aren't perfect. Know where you are on the timeline to maturity. If you're a baby, admit it. If you don't admit it, you can't grow to, a ch to become a child. If you're a child, admit it. Then you can grow to become a young man. If you're a young man, admit it and let God deal with you as a young man, knowing that God will bring you to fatherhood. It, it, you know, we hassle everything. We've got to understand it with the mind. First of all, not every father is the same. Not every father functions the same. Part of that is because not every kid is the same. I had five kids and a foster child, and I had to be different for each one of them. There were some basics that were in the family, but I had to treat each one according to their bend. Legalism is when I don't recognize the bend of the child. Amen. Okay. Now these things gave Jesus the security to empty himself and become a servant. Philippians 2 and 5. He served from a place of confidence in God's grace in him. John 1 and 14 it says full of grace and truth. And the ability of the eternal spirit to enable him to fulfill that destiny. Jesus made it as a man, and he made it th who through the eternal spirit offered himself up. And if that's the way he did it, that's the only way we can do it. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. So we learn to do it right. And when we don't submit to the Holy Spirit, guess what? We get some mess. So the third thing it produced was integrity. I call biblical integrity equals a standard raised. And God is raising the standard in this hour, not lowering it and compromising it. As we study the word integrity, we see its importance. Integrity qualified David to receive the revelation of the temple. God's permanent dwelling place in Israel. Integrity caused David to be caught into Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Where did, he, where did he see the 24 courses? Which has me suspicious that there are 24 courses of worshipers around the throne. That the elders represent companies of people. Well, we won't go there. <clears throat> Try and behave. It's not easy. All right. <laughs> if integrity was such a quality, we need to have it restored to the church today. Amen. Because I believe this is so, I want us to look closely at the few scriptures that enlarge our understanding of this quality of character. Remember, God's more concerned about you being a person of character and quality than he is about your ability to be a prophetic. Oh, that's good. Genesis 20 and verse 5, 
said he not unto me, she is my sister? This is Abimelech speaking to God, okay? As far as we know, he'd never met God before. I want you to hear that, because what, what that makes this scripture just boom, 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 blow your mind. She, he said, she is my sister. And she even said herself, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. God is speaking to an unsaved, unredeemed man about the integrity he has. In Adam, that's absolutely astounding. Mm -hmm. God's saying, Abimelech, yes, you do have integrity. And because of that, because of your integrity, I withheld you from sinning against me. Not against Abraham. Mm -hmm. Against me. Therefore, I suffered thee not to touch her. Now listen, this was a restored chick. She's 90 years old. And she's better looking than all the young girls in the land. That is restoration. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? When God restores, it is better than the beginning. And God is bringing about restoration in the church and to his people. Right now, the church at large is a mess. But God is going to restore her yeah. because he's, she's his church, not mine. Right. Right. And he's going to break, break down all the middle walls of partition that we put up to keep us in our demon, uh, denominations. Yeah. And he's going to bring his church together. And it's going to be a miracle. Okay. Here we see Abimelech's response to God speaking to him. There were some things to notice from these scriptures. Number one, integrity is a heart condition. Number two, innocency is a quality that is a companion of integrity. Number three, God intervened for this man with integrity, even though he had no relationship with God before this that we know of. Isn't that? You talk about the mercy of God. We would hardly give some of these people the time of day and here God shows up in a dream to a man who's never met God before saying, you got integrity, man. I have kept you from sinning against me. Doesn't that kind of blow your mind when you think it through? And number four, sin defiles integrity. I have kept you from sinning against me. He, if he were to have taken Sarah, by the way, you realize that Isaac was probably in Sarah's womb at this time? Because this was after God had said to Abraham, in a year you're going to have a baby in your arms. God moved to preserve his seed. God is going to move in this last day to preserve his seed. His natural seed, Israel, no matter what they do to try and take her out, God's going to preserve her. But also the church of the living God is going to be preserved because it's God's seed. First Kings 9 and 4, And if thou walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and in uprightness, and do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and judgments, and he goes on to say, this is what I'll do. Notice that here it is God himself that uses David as a measuring stick. That's awesome. God's testimony of David. 
I'm going to use him as a measuring stick because he walked in integrity with me and he came to a perfect heart. Integrity and uprightness go together. It's integrity that motivated David to obedience to the commandments of God. So, in Job 2 and 3, the Lord said unto Satan, Have you seen Job recently? There's none like him in the earth. I call him perfect. This is God's testimony of a living man. Now David was dead when God said, <laughs> talked about him. But Job is living. And God is saying to Satan, Have you seen my boy? I'm proud of my boy. He's perfect. He fears the Lord. And he runs from evil. And he still, he holds fast his integrity. Although, and catch this, I haven't got time to go into it, but catch it. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Oh, some, I must have done something wrong. Things are going wrong, so I, it must be something I've done. Maybe not. There are several places throughout Scripture where this phrase is used of men of God who are alive at the time. So one of the things we've got to get out of our old thinking is that there's always a cause if things are going wrong. When I wrote the book on Job, and you can get it and read it and take the course, I'm not teaching it again, because both times I taught it, I went through it. <laughs> but I called it Job, tried without cause, but not without reason. And the reason was this. God was transitioning him from hearing God to seeing God. And Job is a type of the tribulation saint. Well, we won't go there. Dr. Bill, how come everything you teach has end time, <laughs> end time <laughs> references? Because God may be a different kind of prophet. Okay? Because everything he's done is to reveal himself to us. And in these books, if we look for historic incidents, we'll see them. But if we look for God and a revelation of God, that's the purpose of God. Job counted his integrity more important than all his possessions. His integrity is more important than his kids. With integrity, there are qualities that stand out. Now, the qualities of integrity are listed on this slide. Perfection. He's a perfect and an upright man. Righteousness in relationship. Uprightness in character. Uprightness in relationship to sin. The fear of the Lord is a component of integrity. Avoidance and hatred of evil is produced by integrity. Integrity's high standard is not easily dislodged. All that you get from that passage. But many of us have avoided Job because we don't understand it, which is why I avoid it. Now I avoid it because I don't want to go through it again. But back then I avoided it because I didn't understand. God is the one that initiated this trial. There are times when God will initiate a trial because of a work that needs to be done in you, and only Satan can do it. Ouch. God created the smith that bloweth the coals. There are certain things that God allows in my life because he loves me so much he doesn't want me to stay in the former dimension. Job's ability to hear God was second to none. 
If you read Job 29, you'll find out Job is not boasting. He's talking about his relationship and experience with God before the trial. And there's not a stretch. Because you see, God said at the end of the trial, Job has spoken me the thing that is right. Now I have to believe that, even though Job said a lot. So God said, I want you to search, search the book of Job for Job's revelation of me. And then my revelation to Job. I may know that changed the whole perspective of the book. Job 2 and verse 9, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? She recognized what it was. Curse God and die. Anything's better than this. How many like the comfort of that wife? <laughs> Job's wife did not understand the reasoning behind his integrity. People will not always understand you walking in your integrity. They will attribute it to something else. They will say it's not worth it. But if God has worked in you integrity, that is one of the most valuable assets of character that you will ever have. Job valued his integrity above all his earthly relationships. Job 27 verse 5, God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove my integrity from me. Integrity is something to die for. Job 31, verse 6, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. It would seem from this that only God can truly judge integrity. Prophets must have integrity. Psalm 7, verse 8, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity, or according to mine integrity, that is in me. Not that it's on me, it's in me. It's something of my character and nature. Here David seems to underline that integrity is one of God's measuring sticks or judgment standards. It would also seem that there are degrees of integrity. Psalm 26, verse 1, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Yes. Can you explain? Wait a minute. We need Mike. I, I don't need that. Yes, you do. Because the folks online need to hear. And I can't hear you. <laughs> You're having too much fun. <laughs> you love me, you know it. I know it. Did I turn it off? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Explain levels of integrity. How many know the tabernacle? There's an out. You're, somebody taught you about it, right? <laughs> There's an outer court level of integrity. There's a holy place level of integrity. And there's a holiest of all level of integrity. Okay. There is a growing up into him in how much? All things. All things. So there's a growing up in integrity. Okay. And one does not preclude the other. It doesn't squash the other. It's built on the other. Okay. Because it's a growing up. Thank you. Psalm 25, verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness do what? Preserve, Preserve me, for I wait on thee. Notice what preserves us. In the New Testament, we read that the Holy Spirit is the one that is the keep or keeps us. This raises questions. What does he keep in us? What does he keep us for? Is it possible that the quality of integrity in the Old Testament is the reason the Holy Spirit keeps us in the New Covenant? Notice how we get around teaching some of this stuff. I ask questions. All right. <laughs> but we need to learn to think. God wants to teach us how to think. Come now and let us reason together. Who's speaking that? God is. God wants to reason with you, but he wants to get you reasoning on his level. Yes, give that man the mic. Okay. <clears throat> 
it's not so much a question, but a, a brief comment. Um, when I was uh, applying for a job at Home Goods, a question was asked me, and it was this: uh, Could you please define integrity? The world itself looks in on, right, and wants to know what integrity is all about. Yep. They may not be able to define it, but they know they need it. And they especially want it in the workers. The word in the Hebrew that's translated integrity the most often by the King James translators is translated a few other ways. Notice the quality of character described by how it's translated. The same Hebrew word is translated this way. Uprightness. Uprightly. Simplicity. Full, perfect, and perfection. Integrity. Each of those, by the way, is a teaching in itself. If we look, if we were to look in the th 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 Thoroth, <laughs> th th <laughs> we would find the following words. Honesty, virtue, Honor, goodness. How many of these words bring scriptures to your mind? All of these words bring New Testament passages to mind. Integrity is the quality of character needed by New Testament saints and ministries as well. And today God's got to restore integrity to our ministries. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'll just leave that there. The fourth thing produced is meekness. Meekness is true humility with such a security in God that we do not defend ourselves unless God says so. Let me give you an illustration of that. I know I've got down here Moses is. But how remember the Apostle Paul? He was thrown into jail and he allowed it even though he was a Roman citizen and he had rights. And then, But in another place, he appealed to Caesar. God spoke to him to stand on its rights. There's a balance between the two. Most of the time in my life, I've let God defend me. Okay? And the problem with God defending you is it takes longer. When I defend myself, I can get right at it. But he's got to set the stage so the best work is done in his defense. So don't be afraid. If God says hold steady, don't be afraid to hold steady. Because God will defend his people. He is my defense. That's my normal stand. So when people come after me and say this, that, and the other about me, I don't say a word. I don't respond. And sometimes I go and lick my wounds and ask God for healing. Come on now. Because yep. when people, people speak against you, it can hurt and wound you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I recognize that if I defended myself, I would remain wounded. Mm -hmm. If I let him defend me, not only does he defend me, but in the defending of me, I'm healed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Moses is also a clear illustration of this. Numbers 12 and 3. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. There are many rewards for the meek. David, seeing into the new covenant, declared that the meek shall have enough to eat, I believe, on every level and be satisfied. Not just enough food to eat, but enough to eat spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Psalm 22, verse 26, it says, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Psalm 25, verse 9, The meek, the meek, not everybody, the meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach, what? Oh, you mean there's a difference between the acts of God and the ways of God? Because Moses was so meek, he was teachable. And it says later in the Psalms, the children of Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew his, his ways. 
I want to be one to whom God teaches his ways. Amen. But it means I've got to learn meekness. By the way, meekness can be learned. Meek men and women are willing to be subject to the guidance of God. They are teachable. Men, many men and women today are too proud to hear teaching. They are in some way threatened by those who know more about things than they do and their resistance is a sign of their insecurity. Prophets cannot afford to be insecure. It will come out and wound the people if they are. Psalm 37, verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Psalm 76, verse 9. He shall arise to save who? All the meek, All the meek of the earth. Why? Because they're not defending themselves. Psalm 147, verse 6. The Lord lifteth up the meek. In other words, you can't be lifted up if you're up already. So they have taken the lower place and God exalts them and lifts them up. Psalm 149 verse 4 He will beautify the meek with salvation. Note, there is a visible beauty with salvation. Isn't that powerful? In Isaiah 11 and 4 He shall judge with equity or balance for the meek of the earth. God believes in balance. Now, I may think he's unbalanced in something he does, but stick around. He'll balance it out. Verse, uh, Isaiah 29, verse 19, the meek shall also increase their joy. So, Isaiah 61 and 1, he will preach good tidings unto who? The meek, those who are willing and lowly in heart, meek and lowly in heart. In Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness and seek meekness. Now, if they're already meek, there are dimensions of meekness. Catch that? Okay. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Listen, that lets you know you're going to be here. Okay? But I can be hid in the day of the Lord's anger as I remain meek and seek meekness. Seek the lowest place. Meekness is a quality to be sought. In Matthew 5 and 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, For I am meek and lowly where? Meekness is a heart condition. Matthew 21, 5, Thy king cometh unto thee meek and lowly and riding upon an ass. Quoting from the Old Testament. Or gentle and humble <coughs> is the combination of words used for that Definition of meekness. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 21, or in love and in the what? Spirit of meekness. There is an anointing that helps us be meek. The spirit of meekness is an anointing that teaches us, walks with us, shows us how to walk meekly. 2 Corinthians 10 and 1, by meekness and gentleness of Christ, there is a, a too often we've studied all the gospel, or we've studied the Old Testament, we've studied the epistles, but we've not studied Jesus. How many know that Jesus is the example? He's the pattern son. Therefore, if I study him, I'm going to find out what the meekness expressed. I'm going to find out that gentleness of Christ. But some people say, yes, but look what he did when he rebuked the Pharisees and scribes. But there was still a gentleness. There was a graciousness about the way Jesus said things that did not allow them to escape the reality he was talking about. That's why they got so angry. They knew what he was saying. And they knew he was talking about them. 
But he was not harsh, he was not hard. And some people interpret those scriptures as harshness and hardness. No, he was rebuking with meekness. Okay. In Galatians 5.23, one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Meekness, temperance against, and there's no law against meekness. Hello? It, I, I call the fruit of the Spirit above the law. The law is a schoolmaster to bring me to Christ, but there is a place of living above the law. Amen. That's where God wants to bring us, so that he said the law would be written in our heart, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. Or another word Paul uses is, let your conversation, out of your heart comes your conversation, your way of life. And in Galatians 6 and 1, it says, when someone is overtaken in a fault, restore such a one in the... Oh, you mean it takes an anointing of meekness to do restoration work? Hello? In Ephesians 4 and 2, with all lowliness and meekness. Colossians 3 and 12, of the mind, meekness of mind and long-suffering. In verse Timothy 6 and 11, Godliness, faith, love, patience, and he's speaking to leaders, isn't he? The books of Timothy and Titus are the leaders. In Titus 3 and 2, gentle, speaking all meekness and all men. Remember, mildness, humility, meekness, and gentleness. Too often we do not emphasize the gentleness. It is not a weakness. It is an attitude of spirit that God wants to bring so that when you approach someone, they are not threatened. We need to learn to lead on gently. What does that mean? Lead at the speed of the sheep, not at the speed of the shepherd. James 1 and verse 21, and receive with meekness the engrafted or the tattooing of the word of God upon your heart. God believes in tattoos. All right. <laughs> What's that? You need to change the screen. That screen's off up there. The hmm. on the right side. I don't know why it didn't change. Yeah. Because you're quoting. Yeah, I'm quoting from. There. Yeah, this is. <clears throat> I don't know why it didn't change. So, the final training for Elijah's eternal, Elijah's eternal ministry. I, I know it didn't, no. and I have no idea why. Okay. Um, if I knew how to do that without messing up, I'd do that. Okay. Okay. The last portion of Elijah's training, now we've talked about the middle portion, which was the greatest portion, but the last portion of of Elijah's training for his eternal ministry. Elijah's eternal ministry was to is not was is to stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You see that in Zechariah. You see that in Revelation 11. And the reason we know one of the ministries of the two witnesses is Elijah is because he's the only one that fits the description there. Okay. Some people say, well, it's Enoch. Or, no, no, no. It's Moses and Elijah. They're the only ones that fit. And they're a type of two companies of people that God is training in the end time. A people who know the ways of God, the Moses company, and the Elijah company, those who... Uh, and, and Moses is also a type of the dead in Christ shall rise first. Come on now. And Elijah's a type of the alive and remain. Okay? Both companies are going to be in that two witness company. So the last portion of Elijah's training for his eternal position was mentoring one with a servant's heart. An 11 year mentoring of Elisha. We think of mentoring for two or three years and we think that's enough. There's an impartation that comes with mentoring. 
that cannot be gotten in a hurry. Okay? Elijah's training was tripart. Much of his early training was hidden, and the four training methods of God to produce character and nature. It also produced a level of integrity that pleased God's heart. The middle portion of his training was on-the-job training, where God brought him into the seer realm so that nothing was hidden unless God did not want him to know. He grew into that seer dimension. Three, the final portion was the mentoring of Elisha, which was that 11-year period of allowing Elisha, allowing Elisha, allowing Elisha to minister to him and learn. Elisha, his reputation was not he was a prophet. His reputation was he's the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah. Elisha was known for his service, not for his prophetic ability, before he got promoted. Oh, would to God that people would be known for their service rather than their oratory, their prophetic ability, anything else. God chose a servant when there were schools of prophets. That is a mouthful. We're not told what he taught Elisha, only that Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. This is probably the greatest point of this lesson. I think it's the final point, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Elisha learned to be prophetic by serving Elijah. Elisha learned to be prophetic by serving Elijah. There is something to be learned in serving that could be learned no other way. So let's pray. Lord, help us not to despise any of your training methods, especially those you used in this lesson. Help us to recognize our teachers that you've sent both persons and circumstances. If these are to be our tutors and governors, help us to recognize them then and to yield to learn the lessons only they only can or they only they can teach an Elijah style prophet. Let the passage of Isaiah 30 and 20 be our portion. Let our eyes see our teachers, even though they bring us the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. O oh Lord, that we might be given seeing eyes so we can allow these teachers into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Are there any questions? Okay, are there any answers? All right. Bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to those who came online and... We're going to go into further training next week.